Hello and welcome to the Poetry Exchange. I'm Fiona Bennett. And I'm Michael Schaefer. Michael, before we say anything else, I must say a huge thank you to all our new followers on Twitter. We've had lots of people picking up the trail of communication in that medium, shall we say. And also to thank a few people who have been incredibly generous and made a small donation, which is fantastic because that's what we need. And we really value that support, not just for the income which it brings in to support the project, doing the things we need to do, but also because when that happens, you sort of feel, that's great, people are willing us on yeah. uh, to do this work. And that's a lovely thing. And somebody, when they made their donation, uh, also gave us a lovely thing that they said. They said they felt that the Poetry Exchange was about penicillin for the spirit and the soul. Oh, that's and I lovely. thought, that's great. Yeah, I'll take that. So, yes, if you feel you are able to donate anything, um, however large or small, visit the website and there's instructions there. So I've been thinking since the last time we were speaking about Carol Ann Duffy and the Poet Laureate ship, which, you know, we mentioned last time because the episode featured last post, that why do we have to have a new one? Why don't we just have another 10 years of Carol Ann? I saw someone say this on Twitter. I thought it was an excellent idea. Oh, I think it might have been me. <laughs> was it? Yeah. Um, I suppose, I don't know how Carol Ann would feel about another 10 years of it. I think we know she probably doesn't really want that from the brilliant poem that she's written uh, with tongue in cheek and a nod and a wink to the audience about escaping in Marrakesh, I think, with a monkey. Oh. Anyway, more of that if you buy her brilliant latest collection. Anything else going on in the uh, world of poetry for you, for you? Fiona's world of poetry. Fiona's world of poetry. I'll tell you what I was listening to the other day. A brilliant episode of On Being. Mm. Krista, Krista Tippett. Tippett's yeah. fantastic podcast. Uh, where she was talking to Tracy K. Smith, the Poet Laureate of the United States of America, oh. in fact. And it just was really, really interesting because she has gone around the country and been talking to people about kind of what matters to them and is writing her work from a conversation with a nation, really, which seems to be, I mean, obviously she's not only writing it from that place, but it was fascinating. I don't know her, I'll check her out. Will you be buying poetry for anyone for Christmas this year? Oh yes, I will. Uh, I'll be buying some for you, so obviously I can't mention oh, that. Really? Great. Yeah. But yes, some collections that will be going to various people, I hope they're not listening. Uh, so one such collection, I would say, is Falling Awake by Alice Oswald, because it's simply one of the best collections of poetry I've ever read. Mm. So that's got to be a good present. There's someone in particular I have in mind for a collection by Richard Georges, which is called Make Us All Islands and is a really, really powerful book. And I'm looking forward to giving that to somebody. Excellent. Top tips. I'm really excited about this month's episode. It's, I think, probably a much talked about poem. Yeah. Uh, possibly as within this conversation, a poem that's been talked about. But when you look again at the poem, there are things there that you had forgotten or...? Mm. Well, much like our, our guest uh, who, who brought the poem into us, it's the first two lines that are really, really famous and that you, you hear being quoted all the time. Infamous, even, Infamous. one might say. Yeah, yeah. I think maybe we should stop this mysterious talk <laughs> and uh, go straight into it. Yeah, absolutely. So you'll be listening to Michael and John talking about this Be the Verse by Philip Larkin, the poem that's been a friend to Hannah. Do you want to read it to us? Shall I read it? Yeah. This Be the Verse by Philip Larkin. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. 
but they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. When, when you said this was the poem, you said, well, what's the name of the poem? This be the verse. I was like, okay. I didn't realise it was, they fuck you up, your mum and dad. Now, which that's is the interesting. Line, of course, that, yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. M- because I didn't that. either. Then this poem came to me with the, that phrase, the first two lines. And those are really the only ones. I mean, I have read the whole poem a few times in my life, but that's what came to me in the beginning and has stuck with me. And it's, it's a very nice title, like, but I only thought about it for the first time today, mm. the title of the poem. This sense that you sometimes get about religious instruction, that it's a controlling thing and it's coming from kind of outside and, and actually you can't escape. So this poem came to me when I was a child and I can remember my mum reading it. And I think sometimes the poems that stick with you are the ones that you hear, not the ones that you read, right? So I'm, I was a child and um, we lived in quite a small house but it was quite often like full of people. We didn't have a lot of money, but there was a lot of conversation. My dad was a kind of radical educator and the house was often full of like his friends talking politics and teaching and learning and education. And I, I was the kind of child who liked to absorb adult. I was a bit of a sponge. I was always reading, but I also really loved adult conversation and sitting on the edge and just soaking in all this stuff that the grown-ups were saying. (laughs) So this is one of these situations where my mum then reads this, or quotes, I think, the first few lines of this poem. Do you know what age you were? I must have been um, nine or ten, maybe younger, eight, nine, ten, something like that. And of course, as a child, it's like it's kind of funny. And then one of the things I like very much about this poem is this kind of bittersweet humour mixed with melancholy that I think I like about Larkin in, in general somehow. So anyway, of course, I thought it was hilarious. Like, my mum was swearing. <laughs> and then this whole idea is quite funny as a child. But also, I think, captures this real ambiguity of being a child and growing up. You know, because I never felt like my parents were fucking me up. Do you know what I mean? I kind of lived in um, this quite, like, nice, loving environment. But... Um, this sense of realising that your parents are human beings, I think. They're, they're not just mums and dads, right? They're people outside of that. I feel like growing up, you're often aware of that tension, but it's a bit... You don't maybe want to think about it. It's quite a difficult thing as a child. So that's when the poem came to me, and then obviously I didn't heed Larkin's advice, and now I have children of my own. And I feel like the poem's been a kind of friend because these lines are very powerful. And I've come, I think, to think with the poem differently as a parent myself. And especially in more recent years, I separated from the father of my children. And since then, I've had a couple of relationships that haven't quite worked out. And I think, and maybe it's also something that happens and you get in your 30s, in your late 30s, whatever, that you start being drawn into more into ideas of psychoanalysis and these repeating patterns. And so if I'm making these mistakes, why am I doing this? Okay, and if I'm making these mistakes here and now again here, like, what do I need to learn about myself to to understand where this is coming from, right? So then again, it comes again back to this idea of the patterns that your parents had in parenting you and so like now that I'm older I'm reading the poem in a more subtle way and at the same time this sense of actually this tension in my own parenting between trying to be a good mum and also do the things that I need to do to be a person and, and things that are outside of of that relationship and this 
the struggle not to fuck up my own children, you know? Um, and at the same time, this recognition that this, this, is the, this be the verse, that I can't, that it's just like somehow that, that the thing to do is to give your children the skills so that they know how they can learn how to, as best they can manage the kind of legacy that you give them. So, <laughs> I don't know, that's where it's come from. I really like this poem. I like it that it's kind of funny and it's, it's deep. And these lines here that, again, I hadn't remembered, man hands on misery to man. I mean, it's a joke, I think, but at the same time, it's this kind of really deeply black humour. It's amazing. <laughs> it's amazing. To, I mean, it's completely amazing to hear you bring this poem in. I think we've all had that thing of going, I know those lines, I know yeah. those lines. I think a lot of people know those lines, and I think a lot of people hold a lot of truth in those lines. Yeah. <laughs> so it's amazing that you're bringing it in as a whole, and it's really amazing to hear, hear about you, you meeting it as a kid, yeah. and that this one, actually this one, which is quite sort of half well known, is one that you've met like really early on. Yeah. From and your parents. From your parents. <laughs> from your mum. I mean, I think that's... Oh, your swearing I say this is the other thing that I was thinking about when I was thinking about bringing the poem to you, that the thing about my mum and these kind of patterns is that her mode of being in the world is quite... She's a very empathetic person and she gets really drawn into her relationships. So she can end up being quite heavily influenced by other people. So I've watched her in a relationship now with a new partner, actually changing quite a lot and becoming quite a lot more like him. And I do remember that as a child, this sense of my mum being the one who was more the parent figure and had less of an identity of her own. My dad was always much more like, had this kind of independent streak that was kind of quite visible. But one of the things that and my mother, as a young woman, she was really, really into drama and poetry. And I think when she was at school, they recited a lot of poems and she was really good at it. And then she started acting. And by the time we were children, that had all stopped. But I still knew, like, this was something that my mum was good at. You know, I had this sense of her being like, somehow I could imagine her on stage kind of reading the poem. So when she then read the poem, it amplified this sense of her being a person outside of the mother because she was also at the same time performing this skill that I knew existed in her but wasn't part of our day to day. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's a bit complicated. I know, it makes perfect sense. <laughs> and I think that's quite powerful as well. Yeah. You know, the, the idea of your of your mum as, as having that power to be yeah. able to sort of stand on a stage yeah, and yeah, command yeah. an audience and hold yeah. their attention, you know, that's, yeah. Um, yeah. Even now I can sometimes once in a while get her to, and she knows them off by heart as well, because yeah. she learned things in this way, we can get her to read a poem. I love how you were talking about how as we get older and at different stages, that, that thing about you, your own self-awareness mm. and how that relates to going, oh yeah. Mm. So you're looking at them and you're seeing, you're mm. seeing them in a different way. Like, I guess for a lot of our youngest years and maybe till quite late maybe, you know, they're, they're parent yeah. figures. They're, yeah. you know, it's pretty clear what that dynamic is meant to be anyway. And then as that gets distance, you start going, oh yeah. You're two human beings. Yeah. I'm now reaching the age where I will, or I've surpassed the age where, yeah. where yours. I might even be having kids of my own. And but it is amazing how much that, at the time when you're starting to recognise things in about who you are, is also somehow the time when you're starting to look at them and go, mm. okay, I get something about yeah. you, and I can get something about me at the same yeah. time. Yeah, you said it's sort of thirties time. I think it's a funny thing about growing up, isn't it? It just doesn't stop, <laughs> and there's just more stuff to kind of. To, yeah, I mean, like I had, I was quite young when I had my kids. I was like twenty five when I had my first son, and I don't think there was much. I was busy, you know, looking after him, trying to get money. There wasn't much time for really 
thinking about parenting and what kind of a parent I wanted to be. And some of my friends who have had children when they're older have said that they spent a lot of time worrying about what they're doing and is it the right thing. But to me, I think that came later on, that sort of <laughs> introspective phase. This sounds too late now <laughs> in terms of the legacy. But it wouldn't matter. No, exactly. This be the verse. Yeah, it's exactly. <laughs> yeah. And then, and that's the that's the kind of, in a sense, the beauty of this. That this is what it is. Yeah. And it actually, it doesn't matter. Mm. Yeah. But I think he is. It feels very tongue in cheek. Oh yeah. Get you know, don't have any kids yourself. So what I, what really strikes me is that you really love it as well, yeah. and that it is the humour in it yeah. actually, and the tongue and cheekness. It, it's something that really yeah. appeals, and maybe it's a lot to do with that sort of how you met it and the yeah. humour of hearing your parents <laughs> swearing yeah. at you. Yeah. Um, I think so. Yeah. I think it's great yeah. that it can be that to you yeah. still. Um, I, I guess maybe, and this is probably coming from me a bit, but like, like I am reading that last bit. If I left the tongue and cheekness away for a moment, I'd be yeah. like, oh fuck, that is. Yeah. That is grim and dark, and there is yeah. a, you know, this be the verse, it's yeah. going to happen. <laughs> yeah. They may not mean to, but they do. There's a kind of inevitability about it, and, and yeah. just the, uh, yeah, the, the, the kind of grimness of it, mm. I suppose, is quite striking, having sat here and read the whole poem yeah. Yeah. today. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Man hands on misery to man, it deepens like a coastal shelf. Yeah. yeah. Oh, that's a wonderful yeah. phrase. It's like this geological kind yeah. of deep history. And it just goes, and it's unseen. We, 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 yeah. we can't really see coastal shells, you know, but yeah. then it's just deeper and deeper into the unknown. Yeah. yeah. I love the, um, they fill you with the faults they had and add some extra just for you. <laughs> I think that's excellent. It's, it's more than a handing over. It's a, it's a handing over with benefits. It's like... <laughs> Two for one. <laughs> I can't imagine hearing um, those words from my mum's mouth mm. at age eight or nine. <laughs> was that exciting? Yeah, I mean, it was like, it was a fairly um, bohemian kind of a how. My father was, I mean, he was such a kind of radical feminist, really, that it wasn't until I was in my early 20s that I began to see the world structured in kind of class and gendered in terms of those I didn't have a sense of the like any kind of barrier he presented the world of us as a place of million opportunities and stuff to learn about whatever you want to do you just if you work hard and you know you're into it you can do it and you know his friends were really interesting and and quite often, like, quite out there politically. I mean, they didn't swear a lot, and they didn't swear at one another or... But, yeah, you know, maybe if they dropped something, like, yeah, yeah you know, like... Yeah. <laughs> it was kind of, like, low level. So I probably had heard them swear before, but I think to hear that word in a poem also yeah. is, really, is really powerful because poetry, like most of it, is quite conservative in the way that it uses language in that sense. Mm. Just the phrase, it's so, yeah. every, it's so we, we're so used to it now, oh, fucked up, I yeah. fucked that up, I'm fucked up, all of that, yeah. but actually, I don't know, it seems like, yeah, it's yeah. just to have that from the poem in the 60s, straight there. Mm. Did your mum, um, I'm just sorry, I'm fascinated by this idea of your mum reading it to you when you're eight or nine. It was like round a dinner table. She wasn't really reading it to me. Okay. So she's reading, right. so there's a conversation going on at like, you know, like food and red wine and... It's a soiree. And some blah, blah, blah. That's blah. not yeah, yeah. that's too fancy a soiree. It's just a, yeah, it's dinner. Just, it's just dinner. Friends? Yeah. yeah. Of your mum and dad? And yeah, yeah, yeah. And I'm just sat there kind of like listening to them. Other, other kids? Well, my sister must have been around, but... Um, but yeah, that was it. Yeah, my younger sister. And would she recite poems just sporadically over the course of the evening? Or yeah, this is the kind like... of thing, like if you get like, you know, a couple of glasses of wine and, you know, conversations going. And I, I mean, I imagine that something came up and she's probably said, oh, it's like that poem, you know, and then said the lines. It's so <laughs> fantastic. I mean, it's so wonderful. 
what would it be to grow up in a place where your parents suddenly start like any poetry? <laughs> you know, just yeah. just to have that. Well, and, like this is what I was thinking, John, that the parenting you're describing and that kind of atmosphere yeah. with, um, you know, interesting friends of your parents yeah, yeah. And, and politically quite uh, out there and quite a bohemian kind of thing. So it's like, I'm not sure your parents did fuck you up. No. That sounds like a really fantastic... No, they uh, didn't in that sense. Yeah. yeah. Which I think um, this is what I was trying to say in the beginning, this kind of ambivalence of the childhood where you know that your parents are people as well as your mum and dad and you know there's stuff that you don't know about them. So to hear your parents say that when you if it don't, that's, that's not your experience. I think it created a kind of dissonance and that's perhaps why this poem comes back to me because it was such like the the sound of it and the the meaning behind it and this sense of um of it not being quite right in terms of what you know I was experiencing as a child and so I didn't quite understand I think Have you read it to your children? Yeah yeah. Have you? <laughs> I'm sure I have because it's one of those that yeah that just trips off the tongue. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, how old are they now? They're four, fifteen and ten, but I don't know if it's stuck with them. That's the next question, isn't it? <laughs> I mean, I suppose that's the thing about you know handing things on. You know, it says man hands on misery to man, but of course there are other things that are handed on, mm. and you know you had a really positive experience of having uh, interesting parents and you know and poetry and politics around and mm. it sounds like you're handing that on yeah to yours I'm doing my best yeah 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 if we were to say to you what what sort of a friend has it been would you be able to characterize it oh yeah it's like your mate who kind of tells it like it is the friend who who loves you but also tells the truth. <laughs> I've got a friend like that. She's not afraid to tell me like when I'm being an idiot or just be really blunt. And that's absolutely fine because she really loves me and she's always been there for me. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. And I think the poem's a bit like that. It's like, it's truthful. I mean, there's misery in there, but it's, it's not without love, is it? Or at least a sense of understanding, mm. you know, and the, this feeling that we're kind of in this together and I know who you are, human being. It feels like it's got bucket loads of understanding, actually. I yeah. think that's exactly what it's got. Yeah, so it's quite compassionate and truthful. This be the verse. They fuck you up, your mum and dad. They may not mean to, but they do. They fill you with the faults they had and add some extra, just for you. But they were fucked up in their turn by fools in old-style hats and coats who half the time were soppy stern and half at one another's throats. Man hands on misery to man. It deepens like a coastal shelf. Get out as early as you can and don't have any kids yourself. That was Michael with the gift reading of This Be The Verse by Philip Larkin. Our thanks go to Hannah for allowing us to use the conversation and to Faber for giving us permission to use Philip Larkin's fabulous poem and also to our good friends in Durham for hosting us. We've got some fantastic things coming up in 2019. We're going to be around and about in the UK doing some more exchanges. We're going to be doing some international exchanges over Skype. We've got some of them lined up. So if you want to find out about those events and everything else we're up to and you don't yet receive our newsletter, we don't bombard you with them. We've been told they're quite useful. Do go to the website and sign up there. I think that's about it for this month, Fee. Only remains for us to say have a very Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year. And uh, we'll be back with you in 2019. Thank you for listening.
Do you know it off by heart? No, only yeah. the first verse. Mm. Yeah. I might learn it though, so I can like recite it at key family occasions. That's fine. <laughs> You're good for Christmas. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that old chestnut.